Did you know that two out of every three guys are going to experience some form of male pattern borders by the time they're 35? I knew it. For me, it was more like 25. Look, I wish Keeps had been around when I was younger because advancements in society now meant that there are treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the beautiful hair that you have. Look, it's too late for me. My hair is not coming back, but don't be like me. Get on Keeps. I really wish it had been around when I was younger. And you, dear viewer, don't have to miss out. Unless you're bald already. In that case, you've missed out. I'm so sorry. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs for treating hair loss, so you might have tried them before, but never at a price this low. That's right, if you're thinking, oh god, it's gonna be expensive, Simon. It's drugs, you know? Ugh. Well, don't worry about that. Keeps starts at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one thing, you don't need to go to the doctor's office, just schedule an online consult, and a bit later, a discreet package arrives at your door, and you can use Keeps in the privacy of your own home. So look, if you're noticing that you're losing your hair. That's a problem that's not going to fix itself. I promise you that. So go to keeps.com slash megaprojects or click the link in the description below and you'll get 50% off your first order. And now, today's video. In the book of Genesis, Cush begat Nimrod and he became a mighty hunter. And in its genesis, the de Havilland Comet, once a humble civil airliner, begat the Hawker Siddeley Nimrod. And it, like its biblical namesake, became a mighty hunter. One that during the height of Cold War tensions protected the United Kingdom from insurrection by the Soviet submarines that constantly pressed against its waterways. This is the story of a phoenix of an aircraft rising from the ashes of a tragically ill-fated forerunner only to have its wings clipped and find itself grounded following the cruel intervention of this channel's favorite boogeyman, government incompetence. This is the story of the Hawker Siddeley Nimrod. From 1951, the burden of protecting the United Kingdom's waterways was carried by the Avro Shackleton. The Shackleton was a fine aircraft for its time, being fitted with an advanced electronic warfare suite, then top-of-the-line radar and surveillance equipment, up to 10,000 pounds of bombs, torpedoes, mines, as well as conventional and nuclear depth charges. But by the close of the 1960s, it was beginning to show its age, its airframe being essentially an amalgamation of the 1940s Avro Lincoln and Avro Tudor was beginning to look a bit obsolete. Its four Rolls-Royce Griffin piston engines were starting to look a bit weak, and lingering doubt was emerging in the Royal Air Force about just how long its top-of-the-line systems would stay the top-of-the-line. The writing was on the wall for the Avro Shackleton, and on the 4th of June 1964, the British government issued Air Staff Requirement 381, and the search for a new maritime patrol aircraft formally began. With a potentially very lucrative contract being dangled before them, the world's great aerospace companies were practically falling over one another to try and land the contract to replace the Shackleton. Lockheed offered their P-3 Orion, which they proudly boasted was an off-the-shelf package ready to go. Just say the word, sign the contract, and the lads at Fort Worth factory will pump them out for you. Harold Wilson, then Prime Minister, was having none of this, however, he was still incredibly bitter about the cancellation of the Skybolt missile program in 1962, which he perceived as an attempted sabotage of the British nuclear program by the Americans. He was adamant that the contract would go to a British company, and Lockheed was duly told where they could stick their Orions. This British-only attitude also took the BR-1150 Atlantic out of the equation, which similarly had been offered by the French company Breguet as an off-the-shelf ready-to-go package the British government. One slight problem with this approach, however. Britain had nothing in production that could match the specifications demanded in Air Staff Requirement 381. This was only a slight problem, however, as the United Kingdom did have several airliners in production which were perfectly capable of being adapted into maritime patrol aircraft with a reasonable amount of work, namely the Hawker Siddeley Trident, the BAC-111, the Vickers VC-10, and the de Havilland Comet. All of the aforementioned airframes were assessed by the government, and with them all being found to be largely much of a muchness in terms of performance and adaptability to military outfitting, the judgment was instead based on the British government's most favorite metric, 
cost, with Harold Wilson reporting the following result to the House of Commons on the 2nd of February 1965 to quote, The House will be glad to know that after we had examined a wide range of different aircraft, comets specially modified to meet the requirements will be ordered as a replacement for the Shackleton Mark II. Thus, Hawkers Italy, who had merged with de Havilland in 1963 and therefore inherited manufacturing rights to the comet, won the favor of the ever cost conscious British government and rewarded the contract, supposedly after offering to give the government two unfinished Comet 4Cs to develop into Nimrod prototypes at no cost. With the contract won by Hawkers Italy, all that was now left was the simple task of converting a civil airliner into an armed and dangerous maritime patrol aircraft. This conversion actually proved to be a reasonably straightforward task, and despite having faced a few hiccups during development, the first prototype, dubbed XV-148, built as an aerodynamic testbed, took its maiden flight on the 23rd of May 1967, a little over two years after Hawkers Italy had been awarded the contract with a second flying prototype dubbed XV-147, which was built as an electronic testbed, following shortly afterwards. At this stage, however, there was still uncertainty over which engine should be fitted, so Hawker Siddeley fitted both prototypes with different engines so the competing designs could be evaluated side by side. XV-148 was fitted with the new Rolls-Royce Spey engines, while the second prototype, XV-147, was fitted with older Rolls-Royce Avon engines. The Comet's conversion to maritime patrol aircraft saw extensive modifications to its fuselage including, but not limited to, replacing the Comet's cargo hold with an internal weapons bay, extending the nose to accommodate radar systems, extending the tail to mount a suite of electronic warfare sensors, and a magnetic anomaly detector for submarine detection. Inside this modified airframe was fitted an ASV-21D air-to-surface Vessar radar system and a, for the time, powerful Marconi Elliott 920B central computer. The fully converted Nimrod also proved to be a reasonably aircraft. Unlike the Avro Shackleton, which featured two independently targetable 20mm Hispano Mark V cannons in the nose for defense, the Nimrod had no defensive guns, instead primarily depending upon speed, altitude, and electronic warfare for defense, in keeping with British doctrine of the time, although these could also be supplemented with two pylon-mounted AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles during particularly perilous missions. Offensive armaments, meanwhile, were leaps and bounds beyond the capabilities of the Avro Shackleton and could include Nord AS-12 Martel, AGM-65 Maverick, and AGM-84 Harpoon air-to-surface missiles. Out of its bomb bay, the Nimrod could deploy a bunch of conventional and nuclear ordnance, with the latter including 20-kiloton American-made B-57 nuclear depth charges, as well as 190-kiloton British-made WE-177 nuclear depth charges, and the former including American Mark 47 torpedoes, British Stingray torpedoes, as well as Mark 10 and Mark 12 naval anti-shipping mines. Not everything that came out of the Nimrod's Bombay went bang, however, and it could also launch Sono Boys for submarine detection. The August Italy Nimrod's performance was also a significant improvement over the Avro Shackleton, with a maximum speed of 580 miles per hour compared to the Shackleton's 300 miles per hour, a service ceiling of nearly 44,000 feet compared to the Shackleton's 2,200, and a range of 5,755 miles compared to the Shackleton's 2,240 miles, a range that on the Nimrod could be extended indefinitely through in flight refueling, a capability totally absolutely absent from the Shackleton. The Hawkers Italy Nimrod also dwarfed its Avro Shackleton forerunner literally as well as figuratively. It was considerably taller, standing at 31 feet tall in contrast to the Shackleton's 17 feet 6 inches. It was considerably longer, being 126 feet 9 inches long, as opposed to the Shackleton's 87 feet 4 inches. It was also comparatively heavier, weighing 86,000 pounds empty compared to the Shackleton's 51,400 pound empty weight. The father was slightly wider than the son, however, with the Shackleton having a wingspan of 120 feet compared to the Nimrod's 115 feet. Needless to say, with capabilities such as these, the Royal Air Force was pleased as punch with their investment, and deliveries of the production Nimrod began in October 1969, with the first batch of 38 Nimrod MR1s being delivered between 1969 and 1972. This first batch equipped seven regular squadrons of the RAF, as well as number 236 Operational Conversion Unit, which had the valuable job of training pilots on the new aeroplane. A further eight Nimrods were delivered in 1975, dubbed the MR2 variant. These final eight airframes retained the same flight deck and general systems of the MR1 variant, but the underwater search systems were given a significant upgrade with Thorn EMI search water radar, a GEC central tactical system, an AQS 901 acoustic system, and it also received an overhaul of its communication systems to boot. 
In addition to these updated systems, the OR2 variant also had an upgraded airframe to lengthen the service life of the aircraft. This upgrade proved a flyaway success, and later in 1979, all MR1 Nimrods that hadn't actually been retrofitted for other specialized roles were upgraded to MR2 standard. Three Nimrod MR1s were later adapted for the signals intelligence role in 1974, where they replaced the aging de Havilland Comet C2s and English Electric Canberras that had been serving in that role previously. These converted airframes, dubbed Nimrod R1s, were fitted with a suite of rotating dish aerials, which were stuffed in basically every hollow space on the airframe. The bomb bays, the tail cone, the wings, and the tail boom were all just stuffed with them. Operating all of this new equipment demanded a significantly larger crew than the Nimrod MR1 or MR2, with the crew of the R1 variant swelling to 29, rations between only four flight crew and 25 signals intelligence operators. Later in their service life, Nimrod R1s had wingtip electronic support measure pods fitted and some cabin windows deleted so that even more signals and intelligence equipment could be crammed inside. An airborne early warning variant of the Nimrod was also produced, but before we discuss this variant of the Nimrod, we'd like you to do something. Take a look at this Nimrod MR2. It's pretty beautiful, isn't it? The smooth, flowing lines that come from it having its engines buried in the wings, the bumps and bulges on its design that just ooze power and ferocity. Truly, it's a beautiful sight to behold. And now, get your sick bags ready and take a look at this monstrosity. The Nimrod AEW-3. Vomit-inducing looks were of no concern to the British government, however, who were not at all concerned with appearances and simply wanted a new and updated airborne early warning aircraft. As the fairy gannets filling the role with their World War II era ANAPS 20 radar systems were starting to look a little bit antiquated by the 1970s. The first prototype Nimrod AW3 took its maiden flight on the 16th of July 1980, and despite some initial teething issues, the AW3 had every potential to be one of the greatest airborne early warning aircraft in the sky until, in true British fashion, the government got spooked by a mild cost overrun, scrapped the project, and opted to buy off-the-shelf Boeing E3 Sentries that weren't as good and ended up costing more than just finishing the Nimrod AEW-3 anyway. Compared to other British aircraft of the Cold War that we've discussed on this channel, which spent most of their operational lives sat gathering dust in hangars up and down the length and breadth of the UK, the Hawker Siddeley Nimrod had a comparatively full and rich operational history, and over its 42-year service life was deployed on a number of different missions all over the world. Its chief responsibility was that of maritime patrol. In this role, at least one aircraft was in the sky 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, patrolling the British coastline to locate, identify, and had the Cold War ever gone hot, engage Soviet vessels both on and below the surface. In addition to its maritime patrol duties, Hawker Siddeley Nimrods also formed the keystone of British search and rescue operations, with one Nimrod from each active squadron always being assigned for such duties at a one-hour standby. Despite being designed for war, the Nimrods were surprisingly adept at this role. The Bombay, which normally carried nuclear depth charges or torpedoes, instead carried two complements of Lindholm gear, sets of five cylindrical containers joined together by rope, which housed a nine-man inflatable dinghy and a plethora of other survival equipment. Similarly, the powerful sensor arrays designed for tracking Soviet submarines deep below the surface of the Atlantic naturally lend themselves well to tracking aircraft, ships, and individuals in distress, with each Nimrod having the capability to search up to 20,000 square miles of ocean. Finally, its world-leading communications equipment proved to be perfectly suited for coordinating helicopters, boats, and all other types of rescue craft. With the details of most of their regular maritime patrol duties being being strictly withheld from public knowledge, Nimrods instead became notorious for their search and rescue role, the reporting of which was subject to no such censorship. Operations which gained particular attention included the 1977 rescue of the Zodiac inflatable dinghy following a failed attempt at crossing the Atlantic, the 1979 Fastnet yacht race disaster when several Nimrods were used to track down yachting competitors caught up in the disastrous Fastnet race and then coordinating helicopters to rescue survivors, and the 1980 Ecofisk oil field disaster when Nimrods coordinated the rescue of 80 nine survivors from a collapsed Norwegian drilling rig. In addition to its regular maritime patrol and search and rescue duties, the Orca Siddeley Nimrod also saw active combat deployments to many flashpoints and conflicts of the latter 20th century. The first such, and certainly oddest, deployment saw it pitted not against the terrors of the Soviet Navy, but against Icelandic fishermen in the 1972-1973 Second Cod War. This conflict, if we could call it that, does warrant a video on its own, and good news. 
I've already done it on my channel War of Graphics. You can check that out after you've watched this video if you want. But for our purposes today, all we need to know is that a disagreement between Iceland and the UK got just a bit out of hand as the disagreement escalated from cheekily blasting national anthems down the radio at each other to fist fights between fishermen to ultimately the Royal Navy calling in 30 frigates, one destroyer, and 11 Royal Fleet auxiliary supply vessels as the situation grew out of hand. When the Second Cod War escalated to the point of military involvement, Hawker's Italy Nimrods were a keystone of the military operation, patrolling every single square inch of contested water where they plotted and tracked the movements of every single Icelandic fishing vessel and relayed this vital information both to the Royal Navy and the British fishermen. Eventually, however, the Second Cod War fizzled out with an Icelandic victory and the mighty Nimrod fleet returned to its regular duties of maritime patrol and search and rescue for another decade. That was until the raising of the Argentinian flag on the Falkland Islands in 1982 and with it the start of the Falklands War, which once again gave the Nimrod the chance to put its war shoes on. Deployed to the Ascension Islands on the 5th of April, mere days into the conflict, Nimrods initially were given the vital task of protecting the aforementioned islands before eventually moving to protect and support the British task force as it steamed south to retake the Falklands, scanning the Atlantic Ocean for any Argentine ships that may move to interdict the British convoy and providing search and rescue capabilities for the fleet. Beyond the British task force, Nimrods also provided search and rescue as well as communications relay support for Operation Black Buck, as well as flying intelligence gathering and signals reconnaissance sorties from the Chilean Desventuradas Islands and the Puente Arenas on the Chilean mainland. The Nimrod fleet was also modified for their sorties into the Falklands War with the addition of air-to-air -air refueling probes, while the Nimrod's armament was beefed up to a thousand pound MC aircraft bombs, BL-755 cluster bombs, and AM-9 Sidewinder missiles. The aforementioned air-to-air -air refueling probe allowed the Nimrod to carry out ultra-long range distance sorties over and around the Falkland Islands, with notable sorties being a 19 hour and 5 minute patrol flown by XV-232 on the 15th of May 1982, in which the aircraft passed within 60 miles of the Argentine coast to confirm that the Argentine Navy was staying in port, and a 8,453 mile patrol on the 20th to the 21st of May, the longest single flight of the entire Falklands War. With the end of the Falklands War, the Nimrod fleet would once again return to its regular duties for a decade or so before getting the opportunity to flex its muscles once again in the Gulf War. As Saddam Hussein's forces marched into Kuwait in August of 1990, a force of three, later up to five, Nimrod MR2s were deployed to Amman, where they carried out patrols around the Gulf of Amman and the Persian Gulf. The Nimrods worked in cooperation with American Lockheed P3 Orions, with the former focusing on nighttime patrols and the latter, with its inferior quality systems, being relegated to daytime patrols. In addition to routine patrols, Nimrods were also used to coordinate British and American aircraft attacks against Iraqi patrol vessels, with the Nimrod being credited with the assisted sinking and damaging of 16 Iraqi ships. The Nimrod's final Final deployment came during the War of Terror, where they were deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan. You might not think there was much demand for a maritime patrol aircraft in the blistering dry deserts of Iraq and the landlocked mountains of Afghanistan. You'd be wrong. Although very much intended for tracking shipping, the advanced sensors of the Nimrod proved adept for overland intelligence gathering sorties as well as directing attacks for friendly forces. Well, all good things must come to an end, and despite the Nimrod fleet providing decades of dependable service, the world of aviation is a fast-evolving one, and with the millennium ratcheting ever closer, those once world-beating aircraft were starting to show their age. But the powers that be saw some life in the old Nimrods yet, and thus in December of 1996, work began on a complete overhaul and modernization program for the Nimrod, dubbed the Nimrod MR4. The Nimrod MR4 was to essentially be a brand new aircraft, with the existing fuselages being refurbished and refitted with large wings, the old Rolls-Royce Spey engines being replaced by new Rolls-Royce BR-710s, and a new glass cockpit being fitted. Initially, all appeared rosy for the MR4, and the first prototype took its maiden flight on the 26th of August 2004, and subsequently passed testing with flying colors. But then in 2010, at the 11th hour, when three prototypes and two production aircraft had been completed, a creature, most foul and wicked, set its sights upon the MR2, a creature with no regard for logic nor reason. And of course, we're talking about the politician. Having won the 2010 general election, David Cameron and his goon, uh, 
sorry, sorry, I meant Secretary of State for Defense Liam Fox, was scuttling around the ancient halls of Westminster, knife in hand, desperately looking for things to cut and sacrifice on the altar of half-baked manifesto promises when they happened to stumble across the MR4. Having received some negative press for cost overruns and delays, the MR4 made the perfect sacrifice, and the MR4 was unceremoniously cancelled on the 19th of October 2010, with the British government instead opting to buy five American Boeing P8 Poseidons to fill the role instead. There was, however, one small, teeny tiny problem with this plan. The Nimrod MR2 had been retired in March 2010 in anticipation of the MR4's future entry to service, and the P8 Poseidons wouldn't be ready for another decade. Consequently, for an entire decade, Russian submarines were able to navigate the UK's waters nearly completely undetected and unopposed, only being detected and opposed when the British government occasionally stuck its tail between its legs and asked France, Canada, or the US if it could please, please, pretty please borrow some of their maritime patrol air. Aircraft. And, of course, history has again proven that it would have been cheaper in the long run to just finish the bloody British project. And thus concludes the story of the Hawker Siddeley Nimrod, an amazing aircraft denied its chance to retire in glory after a long and great service to its nation, instead relegated to naught but a footnote in the long and sordid history of the British government's incompetent meddling in matters of military procurement. Now, we're no strangers to government incompetence on this channel. Sadly, it's unavoidable, as government incompetence is kind of an ingrained element of British aviation history, but even among the numerous examples of government incompetence that we've discussed on this channel, this has to be the single biggest screw-up that we've yet discussed. Not only did the government further decimate British jobs and industry and send yet more money overseas, but they seriously undermined the UK's defence in the process. But then again, this was the government that cancelled the Harrier jump jet without a replacement, and for years had aircraft carriers without any fixed-ring aircraft on them. So, well, maybe we should just not be surprised.